This is Chiezan, the prior at Sokokoji Buddhist Monastery. Sokozan offers these talks without expecting anything in return. If you value these talks and would like them to continue, please visit our donate page at www.sokokoji.org. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're at, of course. So I'm just FYI, I'm doing quite a bit better today than I was yesterday. So why, I don't know. But probably has to do with uh, Well, what would you say it has to do with? <laughs> what the hell is it? I don't know. I don't know what anything is. But here I am. I'm, I have pretty good energy. I think maybe because I got about 10 hours sleep, that helped. And also uh, working with a bunch of other things I won't go into. So also before I start uh, this morning's Dharma talk, which is titled Taste Fear. Taste it. Before I go into that, I want to, again, ask you for help. Uh, we, for years, we've had just this little mandala uh, of, uh, of uh, training people for a long time. long time, people like Chazan's lived here for 10 years. Other people have been uh, uh, coming here to this situation for a long period of time. I want to ask for your help in not only continuing to do what we do with this community with, I think we own what, nine buildings now, all in this area, uh, rather than build more uh, in around the monastery, we've been spreading out into the community, which we intend to keep doing. We need help. We want to try to work with this community in such a way that it will support it and give it some kind of an option that is, that is fundamentally help, healthy to uh, the sanity. We're not trying to convert people to Buddhism. Uh, people convert themselves. There's no promises. There's no particular propaganda. So anyway, go to the website, donate if you can, and we appreciate that. And if you want this to continue, which you probably do. So anyway, let's do that. Let's continue. Fear. Now, you might say, some might say, a lot of people actually say, well, I'm, you know, other people talk about fear and I'm not particularly afraid of anything. That's because it's covered up. If you think you're not afraid, that's the very nature to think you, me, are not afraid. That thing that other people seem to be having trouble with. So what I am recommending to you, based on what I've been doing for a little while, is meet the fear as it arises, as it shows up. <clears throat> uh, I can give a good example of that from my own, I don't often do this, but or maybe I do, maybe I do it all the time. Well, I really love myself, so I'll talk about myself quite a bit. <clears throat> but and Mason was there, and just uh, seeing Takudo there made me realize that he uh, he was at one of my, <clears throat> I think it was the first Dharma talk, official Dharma talk I ever gave. And it was scary. And this was in, Takudo, you can remind me of when it was, but it seems like uh, it was about 1970. 76, maybe. So you would have been 10, 10 years old. Talking about bowing. Yes. Uh, that's just what I was going to guess. Okay. Good. So, yeah, you're about 10 years old. You just started meditating the year, a couple years previous to that. And uh, but you were there, and I'm sure you uh, probably thought of your dad as being kind of a person that knew stuff and wasn't afraid of anything, and like most children think of their parents. But uh, he saw me because I had to do it. I was choiceless for me. And I, I, I don't think I talked about anything complicated. And I only had three or four people attend besides the Sangha we had. So there might have been 10 people there. 
And Mason was in the back row falling off in this cushion. Go ahead, Takudo. Oh, yeah, I remember it vividly. It was the battle of ego. Yeah. <laughs> so I was terrified. I really was. I, I was, I was, I think I was actually shaking. Uh, and I was embarrassed because I was shaking and I was, uh, I was shaking because I was afraid. And I, I was not, uh, other than the, I was going to do this no matter what. I, I was going to get up in front of people. And if I, I remember even talking to myself so, somewhat, if I, if I make a fool of myself, then that's just too bad because I'm going to do what this teacher has told me to do. Go ahead, Takado. Uh, yeah, I remember too that you had your outline on a set of index cards. <laughs> going through the index cards. <laughs> yeah, I could use some of those, but I don't remember how to read. So <clears throat> I can't, <clears throat> I don't actually do well with notes because then I start to forget who's in front of me and just look at the notes. So anyway, that was, that was very terrifying for me. And I've had a few other situations after that that happened that also were um, scary. I won't go into those today. But what I'm saying is, uh, uh, when I say taste fear, when the fear comes up, just receive it rather than abandon it or go away from it to blame someone uh, or to do something about it. Don't cover it up. Don't cover it up. You can do it. It doesn't last very long, maybe 20 minutes, <laughs> half an hour, an hour, maybe three weeks, maybe longer. It's not about that. What is it about? Train your mind to see. Train your mind to see, see clearly, no matter what. And if you, as a, again, if I, you think you're not afraid, then you ought to come here and live for a while and practice sitting meditation six and a half hours a day. <clears throat> Don't even have to be a Buddhist. You can practice, you can live here without being a Buddhist. So the idea of taste is to use that sense rather than, I would say, just receive whatever shows up. So fear is palpable and it's, it's like something you can go into almost any of the senses because they're all, re, they're all resonating with that fear of, of being, being a fool or fear of, fear of failure, fear of <clears throat> fear, like a, a exa the example I was using when we were talking about, uh, um, what was it, uh, uh, Carl's uh, musical performance of Mozart, that piece. It was about eight minutes long and after, after I said, uh, I said yesterday, after about <clears throat> six or seven minutes, he was just playing beautifully and, um, and not no sheet music, anything, just playing it all by memory. He's an incredible musician and uh, performer. And after about six or seven minutes. What was it he said? Because I, I got it. Huh? Yeah, he said, oh, shit, like that. And then kept on playing beautifully. <coughs> I thought he said Mason's or Takudo's favorite saying, which is, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it's good to see you made it back and you're, you're safely uh, in the northern outpost. <laughs> Good to be back. Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure it is. So, um, may, maybe it'd be good to uh, respond to some questions around this. I can continue, but some questions about the way you're experiencing fear or not. Yes. So, in the example of Carl uh, with the music, uh, he he kept playing. It was at our house, and but you talked yesterday about outflows. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. What would happen, what happens is if you, if you have any, uh, you may have some outflows or something like you're receiving something from out here, something that's scary or, or, you're, or from, uh, in the case of Carl, he's playing and so suddenly he screws up and then instantly rather than just, just feel that mistake or feel that uh, maybe a little embarrassment to himself, maybe embarrassment to someone who's standing right there listening, but rather than, rather than cover that up, with something which is an outflow it's just a spontaneous way of just stopping that and retaining your your uh identity retaining your self-centeredness as the one who's playing the one who's giving a talk the one the one the one this person so if there's no outflow then 
There's just uh, receiving that. You're just receiving that as fear, fear of being wrong, fear of being a fool, fear of making a mistake. And to just receive that with no outflow, no one there would have would have even known that he that he made a mistake. I mean, it's Mozart, my my God, it's just like this is complex. I can't remember which piece it was, but it was gorgeous, Mozart. So so the outflow is is something to be not stopped right away necessarily, but just observe that when anything happens. Uh, when you if you you're you're buttering your toast in the mo- in the morning and you and the, the knife slips and it drops on the floor and you say something about it even oh or, or whoops or any that, those are outflows and they're very simple easy forms to track and see that whatever happens receive that just receive that rather than there's a mistake rather than go into a judgment of it immediately this is what protects the ego you protect it protect the self study not willing to what, be a fool as Trungpa Rinpoche would um, sometimes point out by it. willingness to be a fool, a willingness to be uh, incorrect, be wrong, to falter. And so that's that teaching uh, has supported me for a long time. And then you find out that you not only you're willing to be a fool, you are a fool continuously. So quite helpful. And the outflow is not so much about stopping it. Maybe you can. But also, you could just notice that that when when anything occurs that that is out of your uh, understanding of what should be happening next, like you should butter the toast and sit down and have breakfast, but you actually drop it or the toast. <clears throat> like, is a, is there a, a louder whoops if the toast uh, hits face down, or is it less if the toast hits face up? That stuff happens. We're, we're, the mind is is fast at lightning and as sharp and as brilliant and it shows up and it vanishes immediately it vanishes so quickly that the the ego mind cannot even get credit for being that sharp this is why awareness 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 training the mind shikantaza sit down hold still watch the movement of the mind so you can get so clear about how your mind is working that you see the way in which you can make some modification possibly in the way your mind is operating without making it worse or interfering with it or taking your intention to be more clear about something and have it just slowly turn into a cover up so you're more clear cover you're more clear about what you think it is it's a cover up actually you actually actually have to see what it is and it might take years of practice before you see through your projections and see what this actually is and i can tell you what it actually is and i've been doing this for probably 15 years now not separate there's not two different things anywhere it just looks like it and it looks intensely like it so much that it creates incredible an incredible amount of hideouts for the ego so the ego can get 10 15 20 years into meditation maybe 30 40 years into meditation maybe 50 60 years into meditation and still be able to hide out still be able to not quite have what we would say the courage maybe that might apply maybe not to actually go right into the right into the darkness you might stay back and set up camp just at the edge of the before you hit to the peak of the mountain just back a little way so not quite so much wind not quite so much karma so is it um i'm, I'm t- thinking about outflows when we verbalize them, is it different from when we internally have an outflow but don't say anything? Yes, if you haven't expressed it, you haven't said it like, you know, oh shit or something like that, or or instantly blame somebody or something or anything, left what ha- abandon what happened, move away from what happened to what you think happened or, or to an expression of frustration about it because you're not getting your way. But, but you're not saying not to do that. Is, is all of this not dependently arisen? It all is. Excuse me, but we have to start somewhere. Otherwise, we're trying to manipulate it. And when we start somewhere, what are we starting with? Awareness. It's not that there's a tremendous amount of, excuse me, Buddhist, <laughs> Buddhist teaching involving the structure of the consciousness, to all of the Abhidharma literature, literature 
and all of the teachings that are very, very conceptual about something that is not particularly conceptual. And so we have to start somewhere. So we'll start with that. More? So just to be you have four questions today. Well, it, it's, I just want to understand, um, you're, you're not saying to stop the outflows. Is that correct? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm, I'm saying, <clears throat> well, if you could, that would be great, but look at the credential ego would get from stopping an outflow. And it will get it. But if you, if you just observe the outflow, then it becomes, then the ego is not, is not, the ego does not get supported, it does not get supported by receiving what is happening. It gets supported by shutting it down, making excuses for it, explaining it, or turning away from it, or fighting with it. You get, it has to be, in some sense, one of the three poisons. And it can be extremely exotic and it could be way beyond things I understand as far as the uh, complexity. Go ahead. So does this go back to situational where there are times when outflows are very appropriate? Well, yeah, it's, we're not trying to stop them. It's just that when the outflow, like the outflow to I'm trying to think of an example, one that I wouldn't be so good at, but if you were buttering your toast and you, your knife slipped or something and you caught it, that would be an outflow a spontaneous, natural, dependently risen outflow that needs to happen. You need to catch catch that if you can. You need to stop this or start that. But it's, it's not coming out of fear necessarily. It's just a natural outflow based on things are moving through the air. There's no personhood happening. Go ahead. When you're bowing, so in situations where um, maybe we're experiencing some negativity, the, out, the tendency to outflow may become greater are you saying then that um, with our practice on the cushion, watching what arises, that can temper perhaps that outflow? I don't know if it will temper it or not. It, it might, but what will happen over time? Because you're you're practicing watching what moves, watching what moves, just observing the mind stream come and go. Everything that arises in the mind stream when you're holding very still is the object of meditation. This doesn't mean that there aren't other ways of meditating that might be better for you. I don't know. I'm not selling this as the only way of, um, to do this. It's just from doing lots of different forms of med meditation very intensely over a long time. Uh, this looks like the very best thing for someone to, to start on. And that, that actually, looking back on it, this is what Trungpa Rinpoche taught when I first started practicing sitting meditation in 19. 73, late 1973, uh, was just, there was no instruction. He didn't even tell me to roll up my, my, uh, um, my jacket into a, into a ball. So I'd have something to sit on because I was sitting in a gymnasium floor in Chicago, but I don't remember any instruction about it. And there, there might've been something very exotic that I don't remember, but, uh, it was just sit down and hold still. So it was very, very much like Shikantaza. Eventually, he started saying, uh, follow the breath. And then he went to uh, uh, label thinking and then return to the breath. That, that, that continued to be the basic way he taught for a number of years. And then eventually, forms of just letting go, all, go of all of that and just receiving whatever showed up, which is Shikantaza. Similarly, or Zogchen or Mahamudra, you can have all kinds of discussions about this or questions uh, because those uh, basically they, they, they look a lot different. The forms are extremely different. Some of them are extremely complicated and exotic. I would say exotic. That just means that there was a lot of moving parts. And then uh, you had to attend to those by a way of working with the mind by using the mind to create, create images, creation, completion. So I've done quite a bit of that. So I know what it is. I teach it a little bit, but only situationally. Sir. Sure, Bowie. Um, Bowery, please. <coughs> Bowery, please. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the clearing your throat should be louder than that. That way I'll know what the sound is going to be. Okay, good. Uh, I recall you saying before that um, we immediately cover up the fear with anger. You could. Could cover it. Could cover it with something else. 
kind of an explanation about it, a very quick understanding about well, it's because they're getting young spiders. But it could be angry, yes, but is the taste of fear um, different than the taste of the anger? Good one. I think it's just a different uh, part of the sequence. You might be starting with uh, awareness of the anger. I remember once being in the middle of it, and I didn't fight much when I was young, but I was probably 14, 13, 14, and someone wanted to fight with me. And I, I can't remember. I, I remember I tried to get out of it, but at that age, you don't want to be a coward. So I was not particularly a fighter. But it was out, it was a, a, in the middle school, and he, he came out, and at one time we were good friends, and he attacked me. And, and, and he was taller than I was, and probably stronger than I was, and um, prob probably would have won the fight if someone hadn't broke it up. But I remember there was a point in there where I was, where I was very afraid, afraid of being hurt, afraid, 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 afraid of being embarrassed. And he was punching me, and, uh, and, and uh, then something turned where I turned the fear, uh, and, uh, you know, suddenly turned to, uh, what is that? What happens when, what is that called when you get a rush of energy? Yeah, suddenly I got some kind of adrenaline took over and I started hitting him. And then I was kind of getting off on it, <laughs> just, you know, hitting. But then before I could follow through and kick his butt, you know, the, I know the principal or one of the counselors came out and put an end to it. Terrible situation. I didn't get to win. <laughs> yes, sir. Shokabai, is there fear without paranoia? Yeah, there's fear without that. It's a, a situational thing. If a, if a, if you're walking through the woods, uh, you know, just on a, on a scenic tour of the woods, something, and suddenly a, a bear comes up in front of you, there's, there's going to be fear because that situation kind of requires that. But the, if it's, you know, maybe there's some paranoia there uh, happening, but generally it would just be, how do I work with this situation? So there's going to be fear under, but if it gets too overwhelming, you get paralyzed. But if the fear, if the fear is just, uh, just receive the fear that's there, and then that'll say, it could be any number of things. To me, uh, anytime I see that on television, because I don't see actual bears, most of the bears around our house stay hidden. And they see me coming out, they back up. But anyway, I would look for a tree that is that is the right. Uh, I couldn't probably couldn't do it now because I'm too old and decrepit. But I would look for a tree that that uh, the diameter of, of something that if they put their arms around it, they they can't actually grip it because. You know, so and then I would climb that tree. Do you know about that? You do. How do you know? I didn't tell you that. I had a similar thing happen to me with a moose. You found a tree that the moose couldn't climb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> that's paranoia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, go ahead. Sure, bye. Can there be, can, can tasting the fear happen without the, the visceral or the, the textural component? Well, that might get worse as you taste it, trying to, you're, you're not moving away, so the ego mind is going to be more and more about something's really in danger, I'm really in danger. We're talking about psychological stuff basically here. So we would, I don't know, say more or ask more, clarify. Sure, Bob. It seems like I can recognize some kind of fear, but there's the assumption that if I'm not feeling afraid or feeling the, you know, the texture of, of fear that I'm covering it up. That, that would be your practice rather than something I would sort out for you in your practice. Just continue to return to that. Unless you have something further on it. Sure, Ryan, 
Are there different types of fear? I don't think so. When you say types, I don't know if I'd go in and give it a structure particularly, but the, the causes and conditions around anything that's arising, fear or otherwise, are going to be going to be extremely and uniquely individual based on what you're working with before that even arose. So the way I'm hearing you ask, hearing you ask the question, sounds like you're you're looking at it as you should be. It's just a matter of continuing. So there won't be, as far as I know, there won't be a conclusion that, well, finally, I know how to work with fear. <laughs> that looked so hard for so long and suddenly, I was afraid when I came in here this morning. And I'm not saying it's an overwhelming, but just trepidation uh, comes up, but it can't find somebody that feels that way. So it can't find an identity, but, the, uh, but the, it's dependently risen. If the emotion needs to, find, needs to arise in a human form, the consciousness that is here. There's, but the individuation of a being there, a separate being that could be hurt or be harmed, nobody's own. I don't know how else to say it more specifically than that. It doesn't mean that you're not here and you can't get irritated with this or that. Or all kinds of things will look just as much uh, like some kind of selfhood, to, even to you maybe, or to others. But the, the picking and choosing is gone. It's not that the picking is choosing is gone to the extent that you don't decide to um, put on your brakes when you see a deer come out of the forest. You don't do that. That, that because it's, it's just dependently risen. There's just no person there that has, has a success story to tell. Go ahead. Shoto bowing. Um, like with Unio asking about the outflow, how that could cover up the fear. We say it's not about stopping the outflow. Um, to taste the fear, do we need to practice not outflowing? No, out, outflow, you might have to go through the outflow. Might have to look at the outflow before you can really see that you're, that, that is covering up fear. The downside of getting, uh, seeing that it's fear, seeing that you're afraid, afraid of something, maybe don't even know what it is, some kind of anxiety. Oh, that's just looks impossible. It looks like we need to go the other way, cover that, get away from that. But the, these teachings, as I understand them, this thing, go right there, go directly into it. That doesn't mean torture yourself, but you have a sitting practice, you have an awareness practice where you can sit down, hold still, and receive what arises in your mind, and teach yourself, train yourself to receive what arises in your life. That's difficult. Difficult, really difficult. If you're going along, everything is fine, and you're in a relationship with somebody you're, say, in love with, and suddenly they don't want you anymore. They're going to go another direction. And that's, there's a kind of fear shows up there, like, well, I don't want to be without them. I don't, I don't want to be by myself anymore. That's, fear comes up there. What do you do with it? Observe it. One. In Kanai, if we feel afraid and then the mind starts spinning some story about it, so it feels like we've distanced ourselves from the fear, if we flash on the sense of taste, are we tasting Tasting story. It really doesn't matter. It's it's about an understanding uh, that you're receiving that. You see that you're covering it up, covering it up, that up with a story. Maybe blaming someone for what's happening, or some other kind of story. It has to start somewhere. Start right there, and then uh, taste the fear might come later. You might not be able to force yourself away from that. You might have to look at that story for a while and see that it's it's crepe paper, or it's it's onion skin, it's transparent. You can see right through that and see that it's an attempt to cover up something that is that is your, you could say, your business, that you need to work with whatever is arising in your mind stream. Mind stream, be responsible. The ability to respond to whatever arises in the mind stream without accepting it, without rejecting it, and without looking away from it. Consciousness, awareness, awareness. 
And that's going to include the way you tell that, uh, uh, being aware of the way this is a story, a cover up that you're making on that, or you're, you're running away from that, from what that actually is into what you think it is or what caused it, who did it, why it shouldn't be happening, why you don't deserve that and all the other uh, elaborations on that. Louder, please. The example of the buttering the toast and the knife. Yes, buttering the toast, yes. Is catching the knife any less of a outflow or cover up than saying, oh, and the knife falls? Good point. So the O oh is something we all, whoops. Uh, quite often, as uh, we've talked about up here, you'll, you've even, I think Kozan was one that if Kozan around is around and I screw anything up, she's on it. <laughs> she tells me. Uh, I was up here, uh, I, I, I can't remember, Kozan was that I, I broke some incense or I dropped something and I said, whoops. And then you said, whoa, you said, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, you, tell, you bust me on it all the time. My dog knows when I say whoops. She comes <laughs> Yeah, because the dog knows. Yeah, and I said, Ooh. you do it too. <laughs> I have a question about Go ahead. it. Go ahead, please. You said the outflows are just an, a natural response in this living body, if I understood you properly. So how come the sutras say without outflows? How can you be in a living body without... Mm -hmm. What's conditioned? Um, I, I, okay, so I feel that the, I'm just going back uh, in time and space a little bit to saying that there's all kinds of production that is totally in line and peaceful and it has a, a sense of equanimity. It's just part of living around stuff. What was the thing that we live around that we ignore that, that reminds us every now and then? Gravity. So it's, it's that kind of, we have the idea that we're going to move from here to there and suddenly uh, we slip and gravity. So. That is a kind of outflow, but when it says without outflows in the sutras, it's basically saying that you don't that you receive the world and you don't produce uh, passion, aggression, and ignorance out of it in some way. You don't, the productions are gone. There's no elaboration on things. And there's different ways that it's taught, probably more clearly than what I'm doing here. I'm just coming out of what all it looks to me. So I think it, I think that's what it is. A matter of the outflows are going to be there. So it's about without outflows just means that the, the personhood that is there ha, has no agenda about success or failure. And so anything that shows up is, has no, it doesn't immediately uh, spark some kind of self-centeredness that is losing or self-centeredness that is getting ahead or a self-centeredness that doesn't, that doesn't care about that situation and is dismissive or distracting or ignoring. More? Does that? Um, I know that was helpful. I think it's a difficulty in translation. Asra, asravas is outflows. Sasravas is when it lands on something. And anasravas is when the outflows don't land. So maybe without outflows is just saying anasravas, but it's kind of confusing translated in English. It is. I, I don't know. Uh, is Chisho here somewhere? Where's Chisho? Chisho, are you there? Here he is. Chisho, how do those three look to you? Honest Ravas, Sat Ravas, and you mean? No, I did. Uh, Kozan, Kozan has it down and you don't, and those are Sanskrit words. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's, it's more interpretative, I think, rather than directly translatable. But... Okay. Okay, well, you know, you can, you can divide that up in different ways, and, and uh, sometimes that's very valuable to go deeper into the nuance, but the, the nuance there is is so extensive that it might be hard to, to um, I mean, it, it's up to you. Uh, you could look at it. My idea is if it's, if it, when it gets over the top, when you're using, uh, when the outflow is starting to cover up something or protect you or based on fear rather than just, just you're trying to catch the butter knife or you're going, whoops. So, but that is an area where you could begin to train yourself uh, because it's very hard to do to see the outflow when you're being frightened by something uh, where it's a little bit easier to see when you've broken an incense stick or at, at the altar or dropped a butter knife or something. Then you can kind of see you're actually producing 
or like Carl in his the middle of his uh, beautiful Mozart uh, uh, playing after six or seven minutes saying, um, oh shit, and then going back and continuing to play beautifully. And so if he, as I said before, if he hadn't said it, and there's been no outflow at all, if the outflow had been, if he'd been responsible for that, uh, fundamentally responsible instead of covering it up with a, an old shit, just a way of talking about it, a way of helping you understand more clearly. So when, so when you see those in your own mind, you can be aware of them. It's not about stopping, it's about awareness, always. Tagado. Just to give you a little musician's perspective on that. Um, yes. Uh, from, from one point of view, not saying, oh shit, would be covering it up, bowing. Ah, <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's my son. <laughs> Very good. Could be, absolutely. Not saying anything would be, not making any comment, but uh, like saying, hoping that no one noticed. <laughs> I, was, I don't say anything, and no one really know I screwed that up. Because we didn't. We didn't, though. And we he, didn't. Because he kept playing. Yeah, he kept playing, but we noticed the, oh, shit. <laughs> For the questions, did you? A question from School Stream. Yes. I'm experiencing rare anger and rage to the point where I'm calling old friends out on the cruel behavior. I'm still full of cruelty. I've never felt this before since I was a teenager. Help, please. So I, I don't, School String, I've heard from you off and on a lot. I've never met you face to face or talked to you. And it's not necessary to do that. You do whatever you want to do. But my, my basic feedback for you would be sit more, sit more. You don't have to join me or be a Buddhist, um, but uh, the way you're asking the question and what I understand, not only from this, but the, 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 quali the feeling I've had every time I've heard a question from you over the last couple of years, that's what needs to happen more. And if you come back and say, I'm sitting 10 hours a day, I would still say sit more. And I would also say, if you're sitting in any other fashion other than shikantaza, change it. Sit, sit. You don't have to even call it shikantaza. Sit down, hold still for as long as you can without being macho and observe what moves so that you can see the, what, how to work with that anger and that relationship to your friends. Your friends, I'm just making a general statement here, they're probably not, don't have mind training going on. And so they're living out their karma. They are, they are doing what they're told by their mind stream. They're obeying their thought patterns, their conditioning. Most of the world, billions of people are living that way. Even the ones who are really, really highly intelligent and are, are uh, they might even be scholars of Buddhism, possibly. But without mind training, you're gonna fight with something. Further? Go, go ahead, Miyoka. Miyoka bowing. Um, so, um, tasting fear is another way of saying less is better. Yeah, I'd say so. If the fear comes up, just. I can say feel the fear. I'm using the word taste because something about taste is so incredibly personal and, and subjective. So uh, taste, even uh, the, the Tibetan for that, I think is, a, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but rochig, which means one taste. And what this is saying, it's not saying that we're all one. It's just say, it's saying if you see what this is, it has, has one flavor to it. And it's an astonishing uh, way of talking about because I'm a very visual, um, but that's, that's an astonishing way of talking about the nature of ultimate truth when it's seen in the relative. So it's, it's, it, you'll never know it directly because it's, you can't know ultimate truth directly. What? Once we're tasting the fear, what about that? Um, or, or does that open 
open up something that allows us to improve? Um, no guarantee. So I can't say that. Do it. <clears throat> you find out. And your particular dynamic there is going to be like no, no one else's. They have all the differentiation that, that come up between any two people's lives, whether they're practitioners or not. You find out. Return to the vow. Any further questions on Zoom? 43 people there. there should be somebody out there that wants to ask a question. Gokudo. Gokudo Bowing, when you say you can't know ultimate truth directly, do you mean conceptually? Bowing? Yeah, basically conceptually. But also through through the sense fields. You 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 sense it because it's sense fields. But but the knowing of it is uh, uh, the knowing uh, that is when we talk about knowing, it's usually relative knowing. This is wisdom is wisdom doesn't know something else. It, does, it only knows wisdom, but that kind of ends the concept conceptual you know, structure there because it's it's like, yeah, okay, you know, now what do I do? So and what I say is continue to see it so that you see it. If you see it, it's both devastating and difficult, and it's uh, amazing. And it's not too, all of that emotional stuff comes together. And if there's a self there, it can be extremely scary or, or not, maybe not. Yokuro Bowing, is direct perception direct knowing? Bowing. Yes and no. <laughs> Because if we get if it gets too direct knowing, then we then there's a little tiny a sliver of a credential in there that we actually see it. If you think you're you know more than others, or you're better than others, or if you're more enlightened than anybody, uh, then uh, it's a big misunderstanding. Because we're not separate, so there there really can't be a Buddha other than everyone is Buddha. This is what's been talking. It's not some kind of phantasmagoria that. Arising, it's just, oh my gosh, everywhere I look, I see the enlightened one. It's not bullshit. It's a direct perception of it. And that perception will be very, very limited in the sense that it's perception and very unlimited in the sense that it's direct. So that's, you might as well be playing Scrabble. Or Donkey Kong, remember that? <laughs> Donkey Kong? Ah. It's like trying to be enlightened. It's already the case, but it's covered up because of the grasping at a body, speech, mind complex that thinks there is somebody. Liberate yourself by looking at the change in the, in the, in the prison bars. That's how it's done. As far as I know, I'm not saying you couldn't go study under uh, Andrew Holacek or somebody who's working with Deep Dream Yoga or study with Dalai Lama. He'll take you on as a student along with hundreds of thousands of other people. So not wrong, maybe you can do that. I'm not chasing you away. I'm saying, what I'm gonna, what you're gonna hear from me, I can pretty much tell you what you're gonna hear is I'm gonna encourage you to keep looking at your mind. Look at your mind. Mind only. But don't ignore anything else. If you can help. Sure. I'm curious about how Takuto said that even the silence could be a kind of cover up in, in that Carl example. Sure. You um, can explain that. Yeah. You just zip your mouth shut. What's your question? I'll let Takuto answer. <laughs> um, does the outflow, like the oh shit, um, had the ego in a different way than keeping silent? Different dynamic. So, Takado, how would you differentiate between the ego that is the uh, oh shit of ego or the ego that is just keeping silent? Takado bowing. Um, like you were saying before, the mind is incredibly fast. So, it's just another step. 
the oh shit still happens, but then it's concealed. Oh, see that? How can you see it if it's concealed? <laughs> it's your mind. It's an intent, attempt, yeah. yeah. There's an attempt to conceal it. Yeah. Whereas in a way, uh, Carl's oh shit is a little more transparent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he was kind of hanging out there in the living room <laughs> on the piano. But it was a hell of a performance, just the same. Further questions? Cousin Bowie. Go ahead, Cousin. If there is a, a responsive reaction that's been going on for a hundred years, ouch, or whatever it is, and you were unaware of it, but you've had somebody point that out to you. And so you're aware of it, but by the time it seems like the whole scenario is already played out as the um, idea about it starts to converge. So you can't, it's already out there by the time you have any comment on it. Yes. But you say it's covering up. So if it's how it how it regurgitates is choiceless. How can how can we receive that continuing habit without covering it up? So I'm going by the way you're asking it. So it's not separate from that. But I'm saying just continue to watch. Uh, the cover up and watch the lack of reception. Just continue to watch that because if you just watch it and if you try to fix it, it'll hang in there and be fixated. Uh, or if you try to push it away, it fixates. You do anything with it, but if you just observe it, it eventually comes apart because it is, it is compounded. It has to come apart, but it will probably come apart a lot faster than, uh, than it by just by doing nothing with it. But, receiving it, observing it as much as you can. As, as you're doing that, you're also noticing how you can't quite do that. And that's where your question is coming from, as I take it anyway. And I would say it's just a matter of continue to return to it. It's, it can be very uh, difficult because when, based on what I'm hearing you say and based on what I'm saying back to you, I'm saying there, there won't be a credential. So I can tell you that ahead of time. You won't, ha you won't have a success story about it. It just will... Uh, Again, no guarantee either. It will just start to come apart because it gets its sustenance from being opposed, agreed with, or ignored, passion, aggression, ignorance. So the way you ask the question, it sounds like a lot of what you're doing there is actually watching that confusion. I would say just continue. And don't look, don't abandon it for how am I doing? Am I getting better at this? Or that's the relative path. That's the mundane path. The spiritual path is uh, empty of uh, self. Because I'm bowing, so is the um, suggestion to receive a preliminary, because how could you, how would you know if you're receiving without that re statement being a cover up? Yeah, well, it could be a cover up, but you have to start somewhere. So we're going to start with that and, and just continue to look at it, continue to do the best you can, noticing you can't quite receive, noticing this is a cover up. It's awareness, awareness, awareness. And so just continue to, to return to that. Eventually, there's no receiving because there's no receiver. But as long as there's someone, uh, then we endeavor to receive because there's, then there's that feeling of someone receiving. Eventually, you're not separate from anything. And it's not a whoop de doo feeling. It's not like, oh, I'm one with the universe. That's uh, baloney. So eventually, the, the, the self-centeredness is, is unreal. It may show up, it may not. You're not concerned. You're not concerned if you're totally confused. You're not concerned if everything feels like shit all day long. You're not concerned with how you feel. You no longer get a credential for from your emotions or feelings or thoughts. You actually transcended this world without leaving this body yet. I don't believe anything I say, but you can consider it. So Jishin says, can self be in the ultimate? So the uh, talking about uh, the false self, I assume, not the self of the uh, uh, other traditions, or there's some kind of 
magical ultimate self. Uh, it's not separate from it. So the ultimate uh, is, is, isn't other than anything. The relative uh, situation is plus and minus up and down, back and forth, life and death, success and failure. And the ultimate is, uh, is the space in which that occurs. So it's basically the ultimate is not, not separate from anything. You can't find anything else. And it's a, it's a difficult, I mean, to try to make a philosophy out of it, you're, you might have some difficulty there. Important thing is to watch what moves in the mind stream, the cover ups or opening ups or boredom or fear, taste the fear. So that, that helps, that word is meant to help you make that very, that fear very intimate and taste that. Not easy to do. Is there another another question on uh, on the screen or on uh, Zoom? Still have forty three people, so some of you I cannot see. If you're if you don't have your picture on there, there's a good chance I can't see you. Kevin Bowing. That's Kevin. Um, I was thinking of that. Trunk for Rinpoche quote about you might not be able to help somebody, but at least you won't be a nuisance. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's some aspect of the unverbalized cover up versus verbalized cover up, which is that if we're around other people, we just don't stress them out with our shouting. Is there some aspect of, of, of that going on, Bowing? What do you want to know? I, I want to know even though I might be covering up whether I say, oh shit, in my mind or out loud, if I'm around other people and I say it out loud, then I might be stressing them out and triggering them or whatever. But if I say it in my mind, at least I'm not b bothering other people. Is there that kind of consideration? In I think so. I think keeping, you know, what is the saying? Keeping your own counsel kind of thing. I sometimes say, uh, when in our sangha, I say, don't uh, you know, talk and visit and be friendly. Don't gossip. Uh, you can help it. And then, uh, and also, when we discuss uh, the Dharma, let's let's really discuss it and find out, uh, help each support each other in understanding uh, these these teachings. Especially uh, challenge, challenging texts are uh, like the. Uh, Langavatara Sutra is challenging. Some parts of it are uh, more accessible than others. And I think we're on the is it third or fourth time, third time over the years. Huh? I think we started. Yeah, we started in 2014 going through that sutra. And as we just like uh, the, the um, cutting through spiritual materialism, we've been studying. Well, been studying. I've been studying or at least leading a study group on that book since 1975 hasn't stopped. It's been setting it because that book is, is uh, such a, a good book to uh, enter the Buddha's Dharma with, even though it's challenging, it still is a great book cutting through. So Karen. So Karen Bowing, for someone who prioritizes the path and practice overall else, what is the role of an intimate partner when supporting someone who's going through fear bowing? Well, it's, it's going to be very situational and it depends on the person and on what's happening with them. Um, there's, there's no standard. So we don't want to abandon them, but we also don't want to try to do it for them or protect them from that. So sometimes just sitting next to somebody is all you need to do your body presence, uh, perhaps even on Zoom. I sometimes suggest that people, especially in partnerships or relationships, married or just together, uh, whatever, is to sit down and face each other, look in, look in the other person's eyes and do it, not, not 30 seconds, but do it for a few minutes. It's a powerful um, practice to help you and help them to just come to a, 
be in this uh, uh, situation together. And sometimes things come up after that's been done. I think the way it's been said is that you return to your original connection to even be together. And sometimes that connection to be together is a much more than you giving someone a, a advice about how to handle their fear or how to some quite often, unless you're a Dharma teacher, which you, if you're a Dharma teacher, it should be choiceless. You should not decide to be a Dharma teacher just because uh, you've got the Heart Sutra memorized or that you can explain the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, the Twelve Links, on and on, and you can explain this conceptually. You can know an awful lot conceptually and still not be awake. If you, if you awaken, you may not even be a teacher. You may not function that way. You may just be awake in your garden. Did I get to what you were looking for, Sokaran, or is there something more? Sokaran bowing, um, there's just something more, but you are getting to what I'm looking for. My question is, is if we've taken the concealing or the doing very little or doing as little as possible to heart to an extreme. Um, I got you. Bowing. Yeah. So uh, if that is happening... And if it's, if it's your partner, call them on it. And if it's you, uh, look at the extreme and see what happens to the extreme when you, when you uh, uh, see if it starts to dissolve or see if it gets stronger, see if the edges get more brittle. I mean, look at it, uh, taste it for that matter. And if it's the partner, then observe and see if they do anything with that. See if they defend themselves. Is there any kind of defense going on? It's a, it's that the whole uh, relationship area is, uh, it's, it's one-on-one. -on -one. It's very, very difficult, especially when uh, uh, both people are practitioners. Might be even harder sometimes because each person is working on their individual path of what they're working with, and the other person should be there for support, but don't explain or blame or um, don't try to function as that person's Dharma teacher. Not a good idea. It's not that you couldn't help them. It's not that if they ask you a direct question, how do you work with this? You can say something about it, of course. You might, you might do that. You might do that quite a bit. You might talk about the Dharma quite a bit. But watch it if you think you're somehow more advanced than the person you're living with, because the whole idea of advanced or beginners, that's why they're teaching a beginner's mind is there, is to let you know this is not about becoming an expert. If you suddenly think or gradually think that you know more than your partner, you're more clear about something. So Grand Bowing, I have a question from Senchu in Kanbaiho. Go ahead. Senchu Bowing, I'm unable to use my microphone. What does it mean to prioritize being a monk, particularly when we are physically but temporarily pulled away? Bowing. You mean like by Kanbaiho? <laughs> yes, Kanbaiho. Uh, he's, he's like a little anchor. You know, he's almost four, and he's like, every time you try to do something, I think you're doing fine. I mean, it, it will sort itself out. You have the intention, you're, you're a fully ordained monk, and you're spending a lot of your time working with others because you're a, a counselor, a therapist, and you're able to bring your practice into the therapy session and work with people where they're at. You're not, not converting anybody to Buddhism, but you're using your own clarity uh, of not picking sides, just being able to completely receive your client. And you get a lot of training from from your child also, uh, working with that situation. So you can't get away from it. All Everything is the Dharma. That's why I'm the whole isolation idea that's been going on for centuries, because of the societies had to be done. That isn't, we don't have to do this. We can actually have a, a family monastery. And this is what I intend to do, insofar as I intend anything, and for whatever length of time I have, 
be here. That's what I want to see is a place that has a really strong center. And you live here. Or you live in the center, you're not separate from it. And you're working with people every day that need help. So this is a this is a the open way, the Mahayana, the Bodhisattva Yana. You're practicing that. Sir. So going, um, as many of us have more responsibilities, um, as, as the situation does expand, is our priority still the sitting practice? Yes, you will often hear me say, many hours if you live in the monastery and if you're a monk, even a, someone who's a monk who lives off in the distance, there aren't many of them, they're students of mine, but you just sit a lot. Is that what you're asking? So how many hours do you sit a, a week? Or about 15. 15? That would be the that would be the limit, the lower limit of it. But that doesn't mean that if you were sitting seven, seven hours or three hours a week even, that there wouldn't be some kind of circumstance around that, that that might need to be what you do for a while. It's very, it's very situational, but you've heard me use that word over and over again. How somebody's, all the things that are coming up as far as your life and what's happening in your life. More? So, in my case, with it being that lower limit, should I, um, if I'm asked to do a lot, should I kind of go back towards that and say, no, I need to be sitting more? You're, you're probably going to need some kind of form to do it, other than otherwise. Otherwise, you're always tied up in, well, this is, is that more important or is this more important? And, no, I would say, if you can, just don't go any, try to keep it at 15 or more, 15 to 20 hours a week. Sitting, sitting meditation, my experience over a number of years of it, that's of all the things you can do to practice, that's, that's one of the most important. You can't eliminate that. You can cut back on the study. You might not even have a teacher around. Or you might never never talk to your teacher. It's a good idea to have a teacher. Without a teacher, it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible. <laughs>